I want to talk today a little bit about what data do we need in one part uh, of the puzzle, which is we're going to hear a lot today about uh, data and what it can do for payers, providers, hospitals, the system overall. I want to focus on the molecular medicine element of that, of can we use this tremendous wave of information that we have to design better medications, better interventions, using that data to reflect a much deeper understanding of disease and what's going wrong. And fundamentally, to get there, where are we at the moment, and, and what are the key, the key spots that we need to make progress on? First, let me just take two seconds to talk about some of my uh, financial interests. As Colin said, I am chairman and uh, co-founder of Foundation Medicine, uh, several other companies in the personalized medicine space, and of course, uh, I should say also a good friend of, of Colin since we were uh, much, much younger. And I'm also a partner uh, at Third Rock Ventures, actively investing in uh, new opportunities in this space. One of the things on the medical side in terms of identifying new drug opportunities that's been driving this is a graph that Colin put up as well, which is the fundamental decrease in the cost of genomic information. Now, Colin put on the slide there saying down at $1,000. As a consumer today, when I order that, you can't get a whole genome for $1,000 fully loaded. If you take the NIH uh, data, maybe it's around 7,000, 7,500. We've had a slight flattening in the last 12-month period of time, but don't worry, that's about to start plunging again, and there's really nothing that is in the way from a technological perspective to, within a few years, certainly within a decade, genomic information effectively being pervasive where the cost of the genomic information is not the core limiting factor. Even today, for example, if you take Foundation Medicine's test and its fundamental cost structure underlying the test, the cost of generating the sequencing data itself is not the key determining driver, but rather other elements that come into managing the overall data architecture and structure. This data is our enabling tests to exist in the real world today that use that information. So if you take cancer as an example, cancer is a disease of the genome, of coding errors. Our programming code has gone wrong. And so now when you want to treat a cancer, what the physician, what the patient want to have as far as core information is what has gone wrong with that programming code? What are the errors? And so you can take cancer cells today, you can take that information, you can use next generation sequencing to decode that information and deliver to the physicians in very short order time, here is what has gone wrong in the programming code for that cancer. And this is not just about cancer. There was a nice publication just a couple weeks ago uh, about treating infants in the NICU. The NICU is the neonatal intensive care unit. So a large percentage of children that are sent, these are newborn babies that are sent to the NICU, are sent to the NICU, something's very, very wrong, right? This is supposed to be a time of great joy, a new baby has been born, but something is clearly terribly wrong, but what is it? And so here in real time, and in, in this actual clinical setting in this hospital, in a turnaround time of less than two days, they were able to use whole genome sequencing for these, these, these little babies where there was something wrong but it was unclear, not for all of them, but for many of them to get down to, again, what was the error in the programming code that was underlying why this uh, infant was in trouble. And again, that doesn't lead to necessarily an action for all those infants, but for some, it did lead to life-saving opportunities. And of course, the idea of doing all of this is that what we'd like to be able to do is when a patient, whether it's for cancer, whether it's in the NICU, whether we're talking about a young child with developmental delays, whether we're talking about an adult with diabetes, is to have that individual and to have the collection of information so that we know what is the right intervention, the right treatment for that patient at the right time. It's not the way that the world looks today. These pie charts that I put up here, the orange is the percentage of patients for each of these different types of disease areas where the typical drug will not work for. So you have cancer uh, in the upper right, 75% of our drugs will not work. For 
arthritis, you have about a 50-50 chance of where the drugs will work. And this goes across multiple different disease areas. Can we use this wealth of new information, of data, to make our drugs fundamentally much better? There's a lot of reason to hope that we can. This is a, one of several examples that have come out in cancer in the last couple years. This was from a Pfizer drug called crizotinib, and this is what is called a waterfall plot. And in a waterfall plot, if you are below the line, that means you're having a very dramatic, significant response to the drug. If you're going above, then you're not. So if you take a look at this, you see that this is more than the inverse of what I just showed you before, where in cancer, 75% of patients wouldn't respond to a drug. For this drug, the vast majority, 90% of patients, something clinically is happening for. So this shows something very opportunist, very uh, full of potential, right? We, here we have a certain type of cancer patient. In this case, it's a non-small cell lung cancer, where we can read the programming code and find the 1% or 2% of patients that have this particular error in the programming code. If you give them this drug, they will have a response. Now, the problem here is that after having a response for a few months, then the cancer will come back and will continue. So it shows that we can begin to see the insights of how to match the right therapy, the right intervention to the right patient using this type of coding data, but it's not sufficient for us to have the solution. So how do we get to that next level? We want effectively, if you will, to have the molecular portrait of a cancer, or, frankly, of any other disease that we're looking at. I like to bring the analogy on the left side of this slide. Before a surgeon uh, will consider doing surgery on a cancer patient, they first will do very careful imaging, and we have wonderful imaging techniques today to make sure they know exactly where the tumor is, and then we'll prose proceed with the surgery for that tumor. In essence, what we want to have is a really, really rich molecular data set for that cancer for, or for other diseases so that we know what is the right way to proceed, not in a single dimension, but in multiple dimensions. And that molecular data set, as we think about data and we think about information, in point of fact goes far beyond just purely the genomic information. Because when we look at, there's the raw coding, there's the RNA or what is known as the transcriptome, there's the epigenetic information that modulates. There are proteomic pieces of information, imaging information. The point being, it might not be DNA information on its own, but there is a necessary and sufficient set of molecular information that fully characterizes a given disease state. But that information itself is not going to be sufficient. This is a slide I took from uh, GNS's uh, website because I liked it so much. That raw sort of molecular characterization of the disease. And when we're talking about data, and that's where a lot, has been a lot of energy has been focused on and the genomic revolution, I think in many ways is going to turn out to be the relatively easier part of the equation. Because if what we ultimately want is that when that cancer patient comes in and is seeing their physician, or when that infant is being seen in the NICU, or when that young child who's two years old and the parent is concerned that there might be some form of developmental delay, do they have autism, do they have some other fundamental learning disability? We want to be able to come in and say, taking this molecular characterization of this patient, we can tell you what is fundamentally at issue and what type of intervention is going to be required. Right? For example, going back to that cancer, here's the molecular uh, errors, if you will, and here are the types of therapies you might consider and the probability that each one will work in this specific circumstance. To get that, we cannot have only the molecular information alone. That needs to be fundamentally paired with the clinical parameters, the phenotypic information, the phenotype. But to do this, for each of those clinical settings, we were using cancer as one, the NICU as another, the development de delay in the pediatrician's uh, office, you need to have the clinical parameters that really, really matter. 
And those tend not to exist in a standard electronic medical record pull. They tend not to exist in claims data. And they tend to be highly unique to each enriched moment of clinical action. And so the question becomes, how can we get that data? Because if such tremendous progress is generating the in-depth molecular information in terms of both DNA and the additional layers that I mentioned, can we match that equally with the right type of phenotypic information? Because if you could, if you can pull those data source sets together, then you can use your, the analysis, you can use machine learning and other sophisticated analytic techniques to associate those configurations with action. And if you can then capture that information coming back in, what were the results, then you can build a fundamental learning system. And that information, right, if you can collect that over time, allows you to have these richer data sets where you can begin to make those effective predictive information. So for example, again, coming in on the goal, if we give two examples, take that young child in the pediatrician's office. A parent senses that something's wrong. They're a year and a half old. They're two years old. They feel that something's not quite right. They go to the pediatrician. The pediatrician also senses something's not quite right. The child is on the far end of the distribution, but children move at different rates. And maybe that's a normal child, or maybe that's a child that will come uh, back into the normal range of the distribution, or maybe there will be a fundamental challenge. We know that many, much developmental delay has a fundamental genetic basis underlying it. It's possible today that you can get the whole genome information or the whole exome of that child and for a significant portion of them, you will find a clear genetic lesion that is highly likely to be relevant to that phenotype. But what does it mean? Does it sort into different types of actionable buckets? Are there different types of interventions that would be useful for that child? Would speech therapy be useful? Would behavioral therapy be useful? Are there molecular targets that could be useful fundamentally for development? Today, the rich phenotypic data Different subtle readings of behavior, for example, don't exist. They're not caught within the medical system. There's no flow of that information that could join that back in with the detailed molecular characterization. So how do you bring those two data streams together? Because if you can bring those data streams together, then you can get what might be sort of the complete data set that really allows us to make those detailed projections of both what might happen from a prognostic perspective, as well as what type of therapeutic interventions might become possible. Well, we're beginning to see some of these data sets, or at least people talking about what these data sets might be going forward. And that was really what I wanted to highlight as the core emphasis here, that molecular information is necessary, but if we want to get to what is going to truly be possible, we need to combine the molecular information with the rich clinical phenotypic parameters that are highly relevant to the actionable moments of medical intervention. In cancer, we see some areas, whether it's at MD Anderson, whether it's Moffitt and M2Gen, whether it's foundation medicine, whether there's some new nonprofit efforts that are emerging, maybe from the government, as well as activity in areas outside of cancer, whether that be at Geisinger, Decode, or other institutions, that are beginning, or SAGE, are beginning to say, how do we pull these data sets together? Who are going to be the multiple stakeholders that make this actually possible so that it occurs synergistically with the medical system, with the physicians, with the individuals that are involved to create these recursive learning systems? And as one looks at this world going forward, one can imagine that there will be these layers of data that are being held, sort of what I call perhaps incorrectly the operating system, but how you take that data and put it into common forms and the various applications that will be sitting on top of that that actually make those data sets useful to all sorts of different stakeholders. And I will end 
uh, with this slide that fundamentally if the goal in personalized medicine is to be bringing the right interventions to the right patients at the right time, we have to take our current system and turn it into, as I said, that recursive learning system where the data, both the genomic information and the rich clinical parameters, the key clinical parameters that you need to know that unfortunately are often not in the, the electronic medical records is the basis, but that it flows back all the way up to the physicians, the caregivers, and the patients and loops back into the system. And I think that there are tremendous efforts that are making progress in this, and as we make more progress, I think we will see wonderful advances uh, in our healthcare. Thank you very much.